Without further ado, let's do your review. So at the top of the list, you've got Hepatitis B Series Administration, Chapter 34, page 523. Prototype drug, Hepatitis B vaccine, couple of brand names, therapeutic class and pharmacological class, both, both are just vaccine. So there's gonna be some principles of vaccine administration that apply to all vaccines. There's some precautions with giving vaccines that apply to all vaccines, uh, and we'll see what those are, right? In this particular moment, we're talking the hepatitis B vaccine, which is to prevent infection with the hepatitis B virus, hep, H-E-P, liver. So this is a virus that attacks the liver, and it's, it, it gets spread uh, by body fluid uh, transfer. And like I said before, HBV and, and HIV kind of go hand in hand because they get spread in the same ways. So we're talking bodily fluids in particularly, pardon me, excuse me, and nurses are at risk for contracting hepatitis B because we're working with bodily fluids and people on the regular, you know. So that's why a lot of uh, nurses in most hospitals, most hospital policies in most places require that you get a hepatitis B series. Because this is not going to be one vaccine you get, it's going to be a number of vaccines you get spread, o spread out so that your body picks up what it's, uh, the sample it's being given, the antigen, and then develops a, a defenses for it so that it, it, it requires three doses to make sure your body makes those defenses so that when you come in contact with the real thing, your body already has a defense against it. That's basically how the principle of the hepatitis B vaccine works. That's why it says actions and uses. Hepatitis B vaccine used to provide active immunity. Individuals who are at risk for hepatitis B exposure Infants, to born to high-risk mothers, healthcare providers, dentists, dental hygienists, um, morticians, paramedics. You see that? So anybody is going to come in contact with, with, with humans, with bodily fluids altogether. Scroll down all the way to the last, second paragraph down at the bottom. HPV vaccination requires, boom, three IM injections. The second dose is given one month after the first dose. And the third dose, six months after the first dose. I like that. The drug is over 90% effective in providing immunity to HBV. The effectiveness of the vaccine in providing immunity in adults declines with age. So don't be surprised if later on in life, like myself, I've been already a nurse for over 20 years, uh, titers to make sure that, that your immunity, immunity is still up to date. Uh, my previous job was with one of the major dialysis companies in the country, uh, and it was required because we're functioning with uh, dialysis and a lot of blood right there. Everybody that works for these companies in dialysis, everybody requires a titer to make sure you have immunity. And if your immunity is too low, then they have to offer you the hepatitis B series. That's how it works. So know that schedule. Administration alerts. Uh, use the deltoid muscle, which goes with most vaccines because... The deltoid small muscle, one cc, one ml of fluid can be administered to the deltoid. So if, if what you're administering is one ml, one cc, use the deltoid. If what you're administering IM is more than one ml, more than one cc, choose a bigger muscle. So that's why most vaccines are given on the, on the arm. Yeah. Obviously, for children, you would not choose the deltoid. You would choose depending: do they walk or do they not walk? If they're already, if they're already kind of bigger, little muscle, you can do them here. But most children that have not started walking, you go with uh, not the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, the muscle on the side of the leg. Right? That's for children. Anyways, I'm throwing that in there. Could you have an allergic reaction to a vaccine? Yeah, you can have an allergic reaction to anything. And you can have an allergic reaction to vaccines. If it happens, it's going to happen within the first, I mean, 30 minutes tops. After 30 minutes, I doubt anything is hap will happen. But there is such a thing as a delayed sensitivity reaction. Administration alerts up at the top. Epinephrine should be immediately available to treat possible anaphylactic reactions. Anaphylactic shock. You see that? Yeah. So we'll talk about shock when that comes about. A little bit further down, adverse effects. Approximately 15% of patients will experience a minor symptom such as fatigue, dizziness, dizziness, fever, and headaches, hypersensitivity reactions, utricaria, which means hives and itching, and then anaphylaxis are possible. So shock. There are many different forms of shock. What they all have in common is that the blood pressure drops. So it's just a little extra. Regardless of the type of shock a patient gets, treat the low blood pressure and then treat the source of the shock. 
In this case, it'll be shock due to an allergic reaction. So treat the blood pressure and then treat the source of the, of the, of the shock. In this case, anaphylactic shock, drug of choice, epinephrine. And it's the same epinephrine that we give IV to speed up the heart, but in this case, we're giving it to uh, suppress allergic reaction uh, from anaphylaxis, major allergic reactions, right? So that's what you need to know about uh, hepatitis B series. Look at your next topic on your list. I have it open on the side here. It says uh, allergic reactions to vaccines. We just talked about that. So epinephrine, and then be careful because sometimes, uh, usually after 30 minutes, you're in the clear. Yeah, for the most part. That's when you get them to sit down and read that pamphlet that talks about the vaccine. Other vaccines that you should also know, the Hib, pneumococcal, meningococcal, varicella, and the, and the tetanus. Those are on page 522. So what should you know about the one at the very top, which is not at the very top, close to the top, Hib vaccine, also known as Haemophilus influenza type B. Haemophilus influenza type B, that is the Hib, H-I-B vaccine. This is to prevent epiglottitis. Don't worry about the schedule at one month to give it. I just need for you to know what the heck this is for. This will prevent epiglottitis. And epiglottitis is that flappy flap that prevents stuff from going down the wrong way in your airway. The flap, that gets infected. If you see a kid with drooling mouth, sitting with a tripod position and drooling, 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 that's a possible sign of epiglottitis. Don't take, put anything in the mouth, no oral temperatures, nothing. And then get the doctor tracheostomy kit. So the Hib vaccine is important to prevent this medic, potentially fatal condition known as epiglottitis, right? A little bit further down, the hepatitis B, and we have the whole prototype drug on the next page. A little bit further down, what else did I say? Hib. Pneumococcal meningococcal. You see them in the middle of the page? Yeah. Meningococcal, this is for college campuses, students um, that are going to come to places where there's a lot of people from all over the world in one area, universities. So if you ever become a school nurse at a university, you know, a, a, a student services nurse, which is a fantastic job. I briefly, briefly kissed a little bit of that role while I was over at UNLV. Uh, meningococcal vaccines is going to be one of the things you'll be really dealing with a lot. The other one is the pneumococcal. This is for people 65 and over. Uh, it's to prevent this particular type of pneumonia that can really take you down later in age. So pneumococcal. What's the other one? The varicella and tetanus. Tetanus, every 10 years, you're going to need a booster. And tetanus is to prevent... Uh, tet tetanus is lockjaw. And it comes from bacteria that's in dirt and rusty nails. Anything that punctures the skin is going to require the nurse to ask, when's the last time that you had a tetanus shot? If you can't remember, just give them one, and then they're good to go for 10 years. And a little bit further down, varicella, which is uh, chickenpox. So this is a herpes virus vaccine. This is to prevent chickenpox from occurring. This did not exist when I was a kid. So I've actually had chickenpox, which means that this herpes simplex virus is already in my body, which means later in life at some point, I, if I ever go immunocompromised, it could be that I could develop shingles because I've had chickenpox in the past. It's the same virus. It's the same virus. Look at that, right? So those of us that did get a vaccine for chickenpox, we don't have to worry about, about shingles later on in life. And remember, shingles, chicken pox, what's the type of isolation for this? Airborne. Airborne. So varicella, which is chicken pox, airborne isolation. And when this develops later in life as shingles, contact isolation when it's the lesions, but then that spreads into the air as well. So this is also airborne isolation. So what's the other term we have? Rogam. Rogam is over on page uh, 520, down at the bottom, table 34.1, immuno immune globulin preparations. So when we say immunoglobulin, what are the natural immunoglobulins that your body automatically makes? IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, IgG, gained, like video game, but past tense, gained, you've been gamed, G-A-M-E-D. Immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin, right. So in this case, this type of an immunoglobulin is artificial. It's called Rogam, immunoglobulin, Rogam. So this is given for women who are Rh negative, who have an Rh positive baby. Not the first baby, the second baby is in trouble. So this medication needs to be, this immunoglobulin is given to suppress the mother's immune system from attacking the baby's Rh positive blood. 
not the first baby born, it's about the second baby. The first baby, mama's never encountered this before, so she's never seen an RH antigen, she's RH negative. The first baby is RH positive, oh my goodness, so she starts building defenses, but then the baby's born, no problem. Second baby that is RH positive to an RH negative mother, that baby's in trouble. This is why Rogam was invented. So the RH in Rogam stands for RH factor. Because remember, your blood comes in four flavors, A, B, A, B, and O. But then it either comes with or without walnuts, right? With RH factor or without RH factor, which is where you get blood type A positive and A negative. B positive, B negative. You get it? So if your blood is positive, what, regardless of whatever flavor it is, if it's positive, that means you have RH factor. So if you have an RH fact baby that has an RH positive blood, no problem. You're both RH positive. But if you're RH negative and the baby that you're born is RH positive, oh, that's an antigen to your body. Does that make sense? This is why back in the day before people, this is when I was a kid, I remember this. When people used to get married, you had to go get the blood test. And it was something about the blood test to be like to see if you guys are compatible, if you guys are planning to have children. And in some cases, before uh, uh, it was a no, it was a no go for the marriage because you didn't have the same blood type. There was going to be a problem, and then the babies were going to. Yeah, it was a whole issue in the past for sure. This is long. This is a little little kid, and a lot of it I had heard more of it than I actually remember. Anyway, so Rogan, keep that in mind. Looks like we're hopping to the next chapter here. Let's cyclosporin, or is this still the same one? Cyclosporin and methotrexate. And cyclosporin and methotrexate is going to pop up a lot. So let's see where that is at. Uh, I see both of those drugs on page 529 on that big list. These are immunosuppressants. So these are, why would we want to suppress the immune system? This is probably an autoimmune disorder, like lupus, like your own body is attacking itself. So I need to suppress the immune system. That would be a reason we give an immunosuppressant. Autoimmune disorders. You see that? Another reason we would give an immunosuppressant is we just got you your transplant for your kidney or for your liver or for whatever body organ that it took such a long time to find you a match. We finally found you a match. The last thing we want is for your body to reject it. So at the beginning, they're going to start giving a lot of immunosuppressants so that you don't reject the organ. And gradually, there's a whole process to it that I don't know enough about. But there's a whole principle there of backing away from the immunosuppressant and then kind of testing to see how your body responds to this new organ. Does that make sense? I'm just kind of trying to fill in the gaps of why these drugs fit into the bigger picture here, right? So look at what you have. The first drug on here is methotrexate, but it's prototype drug boxes on a different page. Page 622, away we go. Technically, it comes up again, so we're kind of chopping down on your review already at different angles. So we said 622, 622, page 622. There we go, methotrexate. Methotrexate. This is an antineoplastic as well. So this can be given to immunosuppress, and this can also be given in some cases as a, a chemotherapy for certain cancers. See how all the chapters come full circle for this exam? So methotrexate. Neo anti neoplastic, that's the therapeutic class. Look at the pharmacological class anti metabolite, folic acid analog, no biggie there. Look at the uh, actions and uses methotrexate, anti metabolite, available by oral, parenteral, intrathecal, hmm, intrathecal in the spine, right? By blocking the synthesis of folic acid, methotrexate inhibits the replication. Uh, particularly in rapidly dividing cells. So this is why it's useful for certain types of cancers. But at the same time, it also suppresses, uh, uh, what's another one, rapidly proliferating cells? Psoriasis. Psoriasis is a rapidly proliferating cell, so this can be used for psoriasis as well. We keep moving a little bit further down. The concern with this drug is the adverse effects and the black box warnings. That's where you need to focus on. So methotrexate, look at this. Nausea and vomiting at, se at severely high doses. So that can be expected. But look at these black box warnings. Methotrexate carries multiple black box warnings. Combined with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can cause severe and sometimes fatal myelosuppression. Fatal. So anemia, infections, bleeding, myelosuppression bone marrow, because those are the three things that come out of the bone marrow. See that? So fevers or altered LOC, if they're older, that's what you're looking for. Read a little bit further down. Hepatotoxic, 
may cause liver cirrhosis. And a lot of times cirrhosis might be irreversible. Once the liver damages, it doesn't may not necessarily repair, especially if it's alcoholic cirrhosis. That's a little bit different there. And then it says it would prolong the use. Here you go. Ulcerative stomatitis. That means open sores all on the inside of the lips, on the mouth, on the tongue, all of it. It's a bunch of sores. If these sores are already beginning here, that means the entire intestine is also covered with a whole bunch of sores. That's why they call it ulcerative stomatitis and diarrhea. Get ready. You got to stop this drug. So the minute you see sores in the mouth, that means there's sores everywhere. Look what's about to happen. Therapy. You must suspend therapy. Hemorrhage. Enteritis, death from intestinal perforation. The problem is that the cells on the inside of the intestine also reproduce very rapidly. And the cells on the inside of the mouth also reproduce very rapidly. And this drug attacks cells that reproduce very rapidly. And unfortunately, that also includes the, the, the mouth and the intestines. So the trick for having this medication work is why are you giving it and then controlling and monitoring the doses so you give just enough to kill the cells that you want to. Cancer, psoriasis, all these, you know, um, what, was, what were we taking it for? Um, immunosuppressant, you know. But at the same time, the minute you start seeing signs and symptoms of complications, adverse effects, knowing when to back off. So that's the important thing of this drug. It's going to come up a lot. Look it over at the top. Pulmonary toxicity may result uh, chronic in interstitial pneumonitis at very high levels. Very, very hardcore drug. Very thin therapeutic index. You see that? The pharmacodynamics with the very thin therapeutic index. So methotrexate, right? Let's go back to where we were at over on chapter 34. Chapter 34. We were on that table. That's where we got methotrexate out of here. Page 529. So methotrexate. Move a little bit further down. That's the second drug on your review. Cyclosporin. In this case, it is also an immunosuppressant. Look at all of the uses that we had for methotrexate, immunosuppressant, uh, cancer, uh, autoimmune disorders, psoriasis. You see that? And, but look at down, cyclosporin is in particularly used mostly, mostly for uh, to prevent transplant rejection. So this is your prototype drug for this uh, chapter. The one under it is used a lot too, that tacrolimus. But let's stick with cyclosporin. Turn the page, and there it is. Oh, this chair's killing my back. Okay. Page 530, cyclosporin, therapeutic class, immunosuppressant. Look at the pharmacological class, calcineurin inhibitor. Don't worry about that. Just know that this is an immunosuppressant drug, uh, usually to, to suppress transplant rejection. You see that? Cyclosporin, complex chemical obtained from soil fungus that inhibits helper T cells. Technically, that's what HIV does. So this is a controlled HIV kind of effect if you really think about it. You're kind of controlling the same thing, except with HIV, that kills all your T-cells. In this case, you're suppressing those T-cells. You see that? Helper T-cells. Although HIV kills, hits the killer T-cells, but you know what I mean. Compared to some of the fungi, some, uh, some of other immunosuppressants, cyclosporin is less toxic to the bone marrow. So I'd rather go with this than the methotrexate because the methotrexate, the myelosuppression is so bad that it can actually kill you. You see that? When prescribed for the transplant recipients, it is often used in combination with a high dose of a corticosteroid like what? Prednisone. Don't forget principles of steroid administration. You give a lot of them at the beginning and then gradually taper off. If you give a steroid, high risk for infection. Now you're giving a steroid with an immunosuppressant. What's the vital sign you should be monitoring for? Fever, 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 fever. Signs of infection. New infections while you're on antibiotics. That's a super infection. That's something else, right? So we keep moving. What else do we have? Black box warning, cyclosporin. This drug should only be administered by healthcare providers experienced in immunosuppressive therapy. Use may result in serious infections and possible malignancies, renal failure as well. This drug can actually give you cancer. My suspicion is because it probably allows some sort of a viral replication. And as we'll discuss later, viruses are not living creatures. They're just a piece of DNA. My guess is that it uh, allows a particular piece of DNA that, to activate. And then that's what starts creating the uh, tumors or cancers with cyclosporin. What's your next drug? Interferon. You should know that one. Interferon is to interfere with 
viral replication. That's on page 525. I'm not going to get into too much detail with this. Just know interferon immunostimulant. Look at this. And it also has a couple of other, of other uses, but this is immunostimulant as, a, as opposed to immunosuppressant. And it is also used, uh, it, it interacts with viral infections as well. It interferes with viral replication. So sometimes interferons can be used for certain types of viral infections. So keep that in mind. That's really the main thing that you need to know for interferon. Interferon alpha tubing. What's the next drug on the list? This is cefazolin, ceftriaxone, ceph, ceph. These are cephalosporins, chapter 35. Chapter 35. So this is ceph, ceph, cephalosporins, cephalosporins. Uh, the list is on page 544. So cephalosporins, different generations, first generation, second, third, fourth. You see that? We said cefazolin is up at the top. That's your prototype drug, cefazolin. First generation cephalosporin. If a penicillin cannot be tolerated, the next choice is going to be a cephalosporin, but there's still a percentage of people that can be allergic to the cephalosporin as well. If they're allergic to this and you got to try other ones, now you're getting into sulfa drugs or a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but this is what they'll try first. So let's look at cepha cefazolin first. Uh, it is your prototype drug, page 545. Cephazolin, antibacterial. Cell wall inhibitor. Mm, second, First generation cephalosporin. Look at the actions and uses. Cefazolin is a beta lactam antibiotic used for the treatment of prophylactic of bacterial infections, particularly those that are caused by susceptible gram positive. Uh, Cefazolin has been known to treat a whole bunch of different types of infections. Look at the last sentence in that paragraph. Cefazolin is not effective against MRSA. You should know what is effective against MRSA, and that's going to be uh, vancomycin and linolzid. I believe that's how you pronounce it, a Zyvox. So we'll, 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 tur we'll turn to that one. It's on your list as well. But cep cephalosporins are not going to be useful against uh, uh, MRSA, so keep that in mind. Uh, we keep moving on. Look at your adverse effects. Obviously, a little bit of, well, let's look first. Administration alerts. I am deep injections because cephalosporins tend to hurt. So usually you have to give it a deep IM, so choose a big muscle, usually uh, on the either uh, ventral gluteal, dorsal gluteal, or you can always go with vastus lateralis. Uh, we keep moving what did we say. Adverse effects. All antibiotics are, are going to give you a little bit of diarrhea, a little bit of loose stools. It shouldn't be massive to the point of dehydration. If it is, this is something else altogether. Uh, but you should expect a little bit of loose stools, a little bit of nausea, maybe a little bit of diarrhea. Not too bad, not too bad. All antibiotics... Never take them with dairy products because it, the dairy product will coat the intestine and it interferes with absorption of an antibiotic, right? All antibiotics will probably interfere with contraceptives. So female, childbearing age, if she's on HC, HC is hormonal contraceptives, tell them to pick an alternate form just while they're on the course of the antibiotic therapy. The average course of an antibiotic therapy, usually about two weeks, Doses of antibiotics usually come in 250, 500, 750, 1,000, which is a gram. Sometimes, for the most part, one gram a day tends to be the average max. Uh, and always instruct patients there's no such thing as leftover antibiotics, which means you got to finish the entire course. Even if you start feeling better after day three, finish it because this is how super infections get created into the, into the world. So MRSA was not made by nature. We, we made MRSA. In res it's responding to the drugs that we're pumping out there. It's just staying alive, just like us. So to prevent this, we got to make sure that people finish the course of antibiotics. Does that make sense? What else? Am I forgetting anything with principles of antibiotics? Some antibiotics require you to take with, a, with food because they'll give you a stomach upset or they'll eat the lining of the stomach. Some antibiotics require that you're on an empty stomach but with a full glass of water. Pay particular attention to that because that is something that's specific to some of the drugs. Uh, so with those basic principles in mind, cefazolin in particularly, up on the right-hand side, adverse effects. Approximately 1% to 4% of patients will experience some sort of an allergic reaction. So usually it's going to happen early on. You see that? And then it says... Severe hypersensitivity reactions are rare, though potentially fatal. 
pain and phlebitis tends to at the injection site tends to be the main main concern here. Uh, nephrotoxic. Look at the injury. All antibiotics are bad for the kidneys to some degree. On it. some are just worse than others, but just keep that in mind. All antibiotics. You should already be asking the patient, okay, uh, any history of kidney failure? Or start asking some sort of kidney questions if there is no kidney history because they might be one that they just don't even know about. Kidney failure doesn't feel like anything until it's too late. Does that make sense? So, cefazolins, so that's a basic principle there. The other drug on your list, also cephalosporin, is ceftriaxone, and that is a third generation. Look at on the third generation on page 544. First one on your list of third generations, ceftonir, that's Omnicef. That's po very popular for ear infections for children. If you have a kid and he had an earache and you took him to the doctor and you got an antibiotic, this is probably what you got, Omnicef. It's for, very popular for otitis media for children. The last one on that list is ceftriaxin, and damn, that stuff is good. That's This stuff will knock out gonorrhea in one shot. Sometimes one gram I am, and you feel ripe as rain in 24 hours for the most part. So look at what it says there at page 544. Ceftriaxone, rocephin, can be given IV, IM, 1 to 2 grams, Q12 to 24 hours, max 4 grams per day. That's a lot. Kidneys, 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 kidneys. So that had to be a massive infection for you to get 4 grams of cefazolin, no, of ceftriaxone, IV. When you give it IM, that's the concern. It hurts like a sucker. I've had this several times in the past, and uh, it hurts bad. So this gets reconstituted with lidocaine as opposed to reconstituting with uh, normal saline or with uh, sterile water. So keep that in mind with the uh, ceftriaxone there. All righty, what else do we have next on the list? Pen G, penicillin G. Previously, yeah, if... Pen G is old school, old school. So all the penicillins are on page 542, table 35.2. Penicillin, penicillin, penicillin. Pen G, penicillin G, it is your prototype drug on the next page. So look at what it comes. It comes in IM, IV, 2 to 24 million units. So penicillin doesn't come in milligrams. It comes in units. So it's its own um, uh, denomination, for lack of a better word. It's its own metric. It's its own system. Uh, measurements for it. So it comes in units, which is a universal way of measuring penicillin, right? On the right-hand side, it talks about your main thing to look out for is going to be for anaphylaxis. So what does an anaphylaxis, uh, allergic reaction look like? It, does an allergic reaction kind of differ from an antibiotic or a vaccine? An, uh, an allergic reaction is an allergic reaction. The main concern is going to be when the airway starts to swell up. So if they're already complaining of an <clears throat> itchy throat, my tongue itches, my gums are itching, and now my throat is itching, and now you can't, that's the, that's the danger right there. Uh, general signs, you're going to be itching of the skin, hives like utricaria itching, and little tiny hives all over the place. Sometimes people get these little reactions and don't never even find out what it is they got an allergic reaction to. This is serious if it's happening immediately after giving uh, an antibiotic or after giving a, a, a vaccine. So penicillin G, page 543, antibacterial, and then it says cell wall inhibitor. Actions and uses similar to penicillin V, penicillin G, whoop, my book's falling apart, is a drug of choice against streptococcal, pneumococcal, staphylococcal organisms. This is for strep throat, but look at what it says. Uh, culture and sensitivity needed so that you know that you're dealing with strep throat officially and then this is the drug of choice for strep throat. Look at the next paragraph. Only 15 to 30 percent of oral doses are actually administered, uh, absorbed, which is why the, the route of choice is IM. Because look at what it says. Penicillin G, IM, IV. It does not come in PO. Pen V does, but Pen G does not because it's poorly absorbed. So the only route is parenteral. Parenteral. We keep moving down. Administration alert. After parenteral administration, observe for 30 minutes, yeah. especially following the first two. You've never had this before? Holy crap, you really got to watch them. Adverse effects, pain. Oh, yeah, this hurts like a sucker, too. I've had to give this to kids so many times. While most allergic reactions to penicillin occur within minutes, there is the delayed sensitivity reaction. So watch them for at least, look at it, occur several weeks that is a delayed sensitivity reaction. That's what I, you hear me say this often, but there's such a thing as a delayed sensitivity reaction. That's what I'm talking about. 
weeks after the fact. You don't even realize, and then a week later, whoa, and then you don't realize that's what the reaction was. So it does, it, it, it has been documented to happen. Rare, but it does. Drug drug interactions, right there, look. Drug drug interactions, penicillin G may decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. All antibiotics might interfere. You just program that in your head. All antibiotics potentially will interfere with oral contraceptives. So warn the patient before they get all pissed off at you. That happened to me. A little bit further down on that same page on table 35.2, there. this is broad spectrum stuff. Look a little bit further down. Broad spectrum uh, antibiotics. You should know amoxicillin and the upgraded version, which is amoxicillin clavulnate acid, which is augmentin. So amoxo augmentin. So both are very broad spectrum. So know that those are broad spectrum antibiotics as opposed to things that are very specific like for TB. So know your TB meds as an example of very narrow spectrum drugs and know your uh, these as your broad spectrums. And don't forget the principles of uh, antibiotic uh, treatment. Patient comes in, draw the labs first or the sputum or whatever. Draw the samples first. Then you administer a broad spectrum. Wait for the results to come out. Change from a broad spectrum to a narrow, if necessary, based on the symptoms of a, based on the results of the culture and sensitivity. I remember culture and sensitivity. Oh, I'm sorry. This back, this chair really hurts my back. That culture and sensitivity is going to take 24 to 48 hours to to come up. Uh, 24 hours, but they'll keep it to 48 to see if anything else grows within it because it might be multiple bugs that are causing a problem. So that's why sometimes they wait it up to 48 hours. What's the next thing on your list? Gentamicin, gentamicin. Oh man, this is this gentamicin is why I am a little deaf in this year, which is giving me trouble today, by the way. That's over on page 549. 549, gentamicin. These are aminoglycosides. Look at at the top, table 35.6. Aminoglycosides, gentamicin is the one you need to know. So this is not the drug I chose right off the bat. Yeah, and you got to be allergic to other stuff or it's going to be that it's specific to a certain bug because check this out. Gentamicin, broad spectrum, got it. Bacterial static. It's prescribed for, right there, serious urinary, I say complicated. Complicated versus uncomplicated UTIs. A serious, a, a serious urinary tract infection, that's going to be a male. Males should not be getting UTIs. So when a male gets an UTI, it's serious. Uh, who else? Diabetic women, women with cancer, women with uh, other comorbidities on uh, or other infections, and now a UTI. You see, that would be a serious, a complicated UTI as opposed to a simple one. Simple UTIs are childbearing age, female. Eh, it's just a UTI. Give them some SXM TMP. What is that? Uh, SMZ TMP. The uh, Bactrim. Bactrim is a drug of choice. In this case, this is a serious urinary tract infection. This requires gentamicin because Bactrim is not going to cover it. Bactrim is a sulfur drug. In this case, this is an amino glycoside for serious urinary, serious respiratory, serious nervous system, and serious GI infections. Infections with what? Oh, everything from E. coli, Klebsiella. Uh, uh, Cero, Cerobacter pseudonomus, which has a very particular smell to it when it's in the lungs. Uh, gentamicin is effective against many different things, including, highlight this, including some strains of MRSA, but not all. So think about it. If you're not sure if it is or it's not going to work on this MRSA, you might make it stronger. So that's why they just cut over to the vancomycin sometimes if the patient can tolerate it. A little bit further down, black box warning all over the place. Neurotoxicity, autotoxicity. Auto means also balance because remember your ear and your cochlear apparatus are together. So neurotoxicity will include the nerves. You see that the eyes, neurologic. Look, all I see is neuro, 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 neuromuscular blockage. Paralysis is possible. Nephro, nephro. So neuro, nephro, auto. Oof, this is gentamicin. This is why they stay away from it. If you can use other things, they'll use other things instead. What's the next thing on the list? Super infections. Well, what is the definition of a super, super infection? Page 540. Page 540. Right-hand side. 
right hand side, a little bit further down, one, two, three, third paragraph, super infection. One common adverse effects of anti-infective therapy is the appearance of a secondary infection known as a super infection. So I have this infection going on here. I take my antibiotics and this infection is getting better. Badass. And then suddenly, oh, I start with the second infection, but I was already on antibiotics. How can a second infection occur in the middle of an antibiotic therapy? Because it's a super infection. That's bad. See that? Which occur when microorganisms normally present in the body are present in the body are destroyed. The normal organisms or the host flora inhibit skin and the upper respiratory, genital to urinary, and intestinal tracts. Some of these organisms serve a useful purpose. So basically what it's saying is like C. diff, for example. So you have a whole bunch of ba bacteria in your gut that keep C. diff in check. All of us have a little bit of C. diff, but it's not a problem because your normal flora keeps it in check. However, I have this massive infection and you're giving me IV antibiotics so that we cure this. When this is curing itself, it's also killing all of the, it's an antibacterial. So it's killing all of my normal flora inside my intestine and now the C. diff has an opportunity to bloom. That's a super infection. That's an example of a super infection. Does that make sense? A little bit further down. Don't get super infection confused with the italicized word a little bit further down. Opportunistic infections, which are more related to immunosuppression. So someone's on steroids, chance for, a sec uh, chance for an opportunistic infection. Someone has HIV, chance for an opportunistic infection. You see that? Someone's on immunosuppressants chance for a, uh, a, an opportunistic. It takes advantage that the immune system is suppressed. Normally, these bugs would not hurt you, but since it's taking advantage that there's no immune system, it's an opportunistic infection. Does that make sense? So keep those two, super infection, opportunistic infection, a secondary infection if you have one. Principles of effective antibiotic treatment. We said all of that already, right? Let me scroll up a little bit here. Principles of antibiotics, we already talked about those, so I'm going to skip up to ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin. That is one of your prototype drugs. Ciprofloxacin is a fluoroquinolone. Page 550, here's the list, table 35.7. Fluoroquinolones. Scroll down, second generation, bingo, ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin, and a little bit further down, you should also know Levaquin, right below that. Those are the two common ones that are usually given. Ciprofloxacin, and a little bit third generation, Levofloxacin. Either or, same precautions apply. What precautions am I talking about? Look on page 551. Don't forget, Ciprofloxacin, drug of choice for anthrax. Registered nurse, Nevada, bioterrorism needs to know that. Page 551, ciprofloxacin, second generation fluoroquinolone, uh, acts by inhibiting DNA, right, right, right. Uh, the main thing here, administer at least four hours before and after antacids or ferrous sulfate, because iron tablets can also enter. Oh, it's a mineral. So it's the same thing as the antacid is going to be uh, calcium ions. Ferrous sulfate is iron ions. So you already knew this because for all drugs, you never want to give antacids too soon. It'll bind with the drug and then you, you don't absorb anything at all. So stay away from the antacids. You're concerned with ciprofloxacin. Well, you're concerned with uh, fluoroquinolones, right? Because look at the pharmacological class, for fluoroquinolone, which is the same as levoquin, also known as levofloxacin, black box warning, tendinitis. So aches. So you want to ask about muscle pains because they might not know what a tendon is. But do you have any muscle pains? Yeah, it hurts right here. And they're pointing right at the tendons. So you might want to ask about that. So look, tendonitis, tendon rupture may occur. Patients in all ages, but the risk is higher if you're 60 years of age and older. It affects the kidney, the hearts, the lung transplant recipients as well. Uh, receiving concurrent, uh, those are also getting steroids at the same time. And an extreme muscle weakness in patients with myasthenia gravis. So there is a muscular tendon effect that's occurring with this levoquinolone. The concern is the Achilles tendon. That tends to be the one that actually just snaps. The other thing is that there's also, if you look a little bit above it in the adverse effects, they got to stay out of the sunlight. So photosensitivity. You see right above the black box warning, some patients report photosensitivity. Yeah, you got to stay out of the sun. The sun, for some reason, it activates some metabolite inside the, the drug. I don't know enough about it, but I know you got to stay out of the sunlight 
and you got to warn them about uh, tendon rupture, and particularly the Achilles. So that's important to know, especially if you're one of these that's 65 and older and always goes for her walks every morning out in the sun. You know, or before it gets too warm, by 10 a.m., I do my walking. Yeah, but you're on fluoroquinolone, so stay home until you're off this therapy. So, yeah, so you got to warn patients about that. What else do we have? Vancomycin. Vancomycin is on this big list of heavy hitters over on page 555. Yeah, these are the heavy hitters. So, miscellaneous antibacterials way down at the bottom. Vancomycin. And right smack in the middle of the page. Lysonol's li lenizolid, lenizolid and vancomycin, as explained at the bottom of 554 on the right-hand side. Both of these drugs are uh, approved to treat uh, MRSA and in also approved to treat uh, VRE is that lysonazid. So between the two, the stronger of the two is the Zyvox. Oops. Uh, the strongest drug of the two is going to be the Zyvox. That's your strongest drug between the two. So either way, the concern with vancomycin, though, look at if you scroll all the way to the right, anaphylaxis can occur, but that can occur with any, any antibiotic. It says uh, super infections can occur, but that can occur with any antibiotic. Nephrotoxicity, autotoxicity, yeah, but that's with most antibiotics as well. Red man syndrome, okay, that's different. Vancomycin, that's different. What the heck is a red man syndrome? Turn the page, 556. Red man syndrome, a reaction that can occur with rapid IV administration of vancomycin is known as red man syndrome, may result with large amounts of histamine being released in the body. Symptoms include hypotension, uh-oh, so treat the blood pressure, probably normal saline, right, and put the trendel in position, with flushing, red rash, most often of the face, the neck, the trunks, and the trunk and the upper body. So yeah, after IV administration, and particularly hives, yeah. So this is due to the chemical structure of vancomycin. So keep in mind red man syndrome because this can occur whenever you're giving them vancomycin IV. What's next on the list? Vancomycin, urethromycin. This is z -packs. Urethromycin, that is over on page macrolides, page 548. Macrolides, urethromycin. It's the same category as azithromycin, azithromycin. z pack is the same category. So macrolides, what do these have different? We go down to the bottom. There's your prototype drug. Actions and uses right in the middle. For It says its main application is for patients who are unable to tolerate penicillins or who have a penicillin-resistant infection. So urethromycin might be a third option. As I say, if you're allergic to penicillin, cephalosporins. But there's a chance you're going to be allergic to a cephalosporin, so they might go with urethromycin, a macrolide, a z -pack. So this is why they became very popular when they first came out because they just thought, oh, cut to the chase. Just go ahead and give them the z pack. But now you're developing drug resistance probably, right, to these drugs. So a little bit further down, it says, um, and particularly C. diff. This can kill C. diff, actually. Uh, what else do we have down at the bottom? Administration alerts. Here's different. Oral drug, empty stomach, full glass of water. That's what you need to remember. And don't forget that the Z pack in itself is two pills today and then one, 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 one. It's a five day course of therapy with two pills on the first day and then one, 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 one. Look at the top, page 548, azithromycin. Scroll to the right, PO, 500 milligrams, one dose, then 250 for days two, three, and four. Oh, my light almost fell. Okay, we're doing good. All righty, what else we got? Then we have rifampin, ethambutol, isonazid. Those three right there, those are all TB drugs. Those are TB drugs. You see how easily I identified those? That's how quickly you need to see them and be like, that's for TB. That's, if you can do that, you're on the right track. Page 557, identify all three. There's isonazid up at the top. Oh, ethambutol, isonazid. Lenizolid, we just talked about. It's on the previous page. That's the one that's an option for MRSA or VRE. A heavier hitter than, that's a Zyvox heavier hitter, right? We're talking rifampin, ethambutol, isonacid. Ethambutol, isonacid, and rifampin. They're all three of them are there on page 557. So you need to know that all three of them are for TB. If you're going to give them for th TB, you're probably going to be on them, on them for about a year. And you should know that all of these drugs affect neuro neuro so it's going to be anything from vision hearing dizziness 
tingling sensation, photophobia, and don't forget the mind, suicidality, psychosis, abnormal behaviors, safety risks, you see that? Blindness, eyes, you see that? Especially ethambutol. It's neutral. It's a horrible drug. It's not the first choice, but it's the first on this list right there. Look at that. So not, they're going to combine it with other things and watch the dosage for it. So you got to have a conversation with the family members. Don't forget. But ethambutol in particularly, I saw it as it. And rifampin, scroll to the right. Particularly for rifampin, look at what it says. Orange discoloration of urine, sweat, and tears. So you got to warn them because that orange... To some people appears red and then they think that they're crying blood or they're sweating blood or they're urinating blood and for some people that can be very shocking so you got to also warn them also about ruining their clothes so don't wear the nice clothes when you're on rifampin because you're probably going to stain it and probably permanently it comes out in the sweat so you see how there's how at the very first chapter we covered different organs of excretion the skin excretes as well we just don't even realize it in this case, you actually see it because of the color that it tinges the sweat. However, your drug, your prototype drug is isonazid for TB. Don't forget signs and symptoms. Oh, don't look at down at the bottom. Cipro is also on the list for TB down at the bottom. There. However, prototype drug isonazid, abbreviated INH, over on page 558, anti-TB drug, also known as acid fast bacillus, also known as TB, also known as consumption, also known as mycobacterium tuberculosis. Many names. Same blood. So uh, your concern is hepatotoxicity, big time. Hepatotoxicity usually appears in the first one to three months of therapy, but may occur at any time during treatment. So we're talking liver panels and then monitoring for hepatotoxicity. So you're looking for jaundice skin. What does jaundice mean? Jaundice means you're turning yellow. Another word for jaundice, because you go like that and even the eyes look yellow. Icterus. Icterus or jaundice. The patient appears icteric. Ick with an I, I see. Icterus, icteric. The same thing as jaundice, that means yellow. If the patient is African American or dark skinned, you can always look at the scleros. You see that? That's where you can tell if there's true jaundice or icterus that's starting to develop. Um, Coca Cola colored urine is a bad sign of liver liver issues as well. That's a lot of bilirubin that's being spilled into urine whenever the Coca-Cola covered urine, colored urine, looks like soda pop. That is probably liver failure right there. So anyways, uh, INH, so TB. Up to one year, they'll be on it. Uh, trim, trimethoprim slash sofamethazozole. That's the Bactrim. That is over on page 552. Table 35.8, a sulfa drug. Sulfa drug of choice for simple UTIs. There it is. TMP, SMZ, Bactrim. Next page, 553. There it is, Bactrim. So you should know that this is a sulfa drug. So if a patient says they're allergic to sulfa drugs, this is what they're talking about. And then look at actions and uses. Is it most frequently prescribed pharmacotherapeutic for what? UTIs. But it can be given for certain types of pneumonias. Drug-drug interactions, certain anticoagulants uh, might have some life-threatening conditions. Uh, don't forget to warn them about the different type of prophylactic uh, for uh, pregnancy if they're on uh, uh, HC. Let's see. That's pretty much it for that one. Patient education related to antibiotics in general. We talked about that. Prevention of thrush. Oh, that's a different chapter. That's a different chapter. But look at what it says. If it, yeah, that's – I said prevention of thrush – when on an inhaled or a steroid and a bronchodilator. This is a classic NCLEX question. Your patient has really bad asthma and there's a lot of inflammation. So the albuterol, that's only for a bronchodilation. And we'll talk about different types of bronchodilators later, but just know that some inhalers are bronchodilators. Some inhalers are steroids. How can you tell the difference? Because it ends in sone. Anything that ends in sone, S-O-N-E, like prednisone, fluticasone, uh, there's a bunch of them. Uh, those are the inhaled steroids. So which one do you do first? You do the, first it's going to be the bronchodilator. Then you would use the inhaled steroid. You don't want the steroid in the mouth. You want it in the lungs. That's the reason you do the inhaled bronchodilator first, then the steroid. 
some of that steroid is going to stay in the mouth. That's how you get the rush. So you got to rinse the mouth with water and then swallow it or spit it out, whatever, because you're just trying to get that stuff all the way down to the lungs. So you switch with water to get it out of the mouth. Now, if you fail to do that, that's how you end up with thrush. And then what do you need to treat thrush? Nystatin, swish and swallow. So now the nystatin, the drug for the, for the thrush in the mouth, you, and in this case, you swallow it because you want it to coat because usually it's going to infect here and it's going to infect the throat as well, so you swallow it. Nystatin is not a systemic drug because once you swallow it, it does not get absorbed. Nystatin is, needs to coat. It's a topical. But the book says P.O. I realize that because you're going to stick it in your mouth just to make sure you don't stick it in your nose. So you're going to stick it in your mouth, which is P.O., but the actual function of the drug is a topical. It's a topical application. Just like a suppository is also topical. You see that? Technically, ointments and drops in the eyes, those are topical, technically, as well. In case you get an infix question about different routes, just so, so that you see it, you understand the principle of the topical administration, right? What else do we have? Uh, so that's why it says prevention of thrush when on an inhaled steroid and a bronchodilator, bronchodilator first, then the steroid, then rinse the mouth with water. That one you don't have to swallow, you just spit it out. You got thrush, nystatin, that's a swish and swallow. Look at the next one, ampoceratin B. This is already into the fungal chapter. So we're in the next chapter already. Now we're over on chapter 36, which begins on page 567. We're going on an hour. I'll cut this video off at an hour, and then I'll do your part two, just so that they don't get too lengthy, you know? So, uh, so let's see, 568 fungal infections start right there. Your first drug you're talking about is ampoceratin B. This is a systemic antifungal. And like I said, if you would need a systemic antifungal, side effects, side effects, side effects. So in this case, 570, ampoceratin B, the side effect this is going to give you, antifungal, systemic, it's going to spike high fevers, boom. So much so that they're going to have to probably give Tylenol ahead of time before they give it to you. Administration alert, slowly infused because cardiovascular collapse may result. When infused too rapidly, thin therapeutic index. Administer pre-medication such as acetaminophen, antihistamines, corticosteroids to decrease hypersensitivity reactions and to decrease the fevers, the pyrexia that develops with these drugs. Withhold the drug if you got a B when that looks like, or your creatinine looks bad, which means your kidneys. So if the kidneys are doing bad, this is not a drug for you. This gets excreted through the kidneys, yes. Yeah? So you must ask about kidney health. Or if it's a dialysis patient, heck no, they're not going to get this stuff, right? Look at the other one, adverse effects. Many patients develop right there. Fever, chills, vomiting, headache at the beginning of therapy, which subsides as treatment continues. Do you think they'd want to know that before they even begin treatment, before they even decide that this is the treatment option they want to go with? Yes. So patient education ahead of time so that they're good, educated consumers of healthcare, educated consumers of these drugs. Fluconazole, as opposed to nystatin. Compare and contrast those two. They're the next two on your list. Compare and contrast. Fluconazole, which is on page 572, as opposed to nystatin, which is on page 574. Fluconazole, antifungal, systemic. Nystatin, antifungal, right there, therapeutic class, superficial. I know it says PO. But I'm reading it. Therapeutic class, superficial. Even though you're going to stick it in your mouth, you're trying to get it to coat the mouth. You're not trying to get it absorbed into the GI. So big difference between the two. Fluconazole, nystatin. Nystatin is topical, which is why it also comes in forms for creams, ointments, powders, gels. You see that? Yeah. So let's start with fluconazole first. So on page 572, antifungal drug of choice for candida. Candida albicans, which is a thrush, but not in the mouth. Thrush already now in other parts of the body, inside, in the lungs. You see that in the intestines. So unlike, let's see what it talks about, um, it fungal infections down in the lungs and the urinary tract as well. So that's something that you need to remember because of the two. And you see that on the following page on table 36.3, fluconazole, PO, IV, 
the big thing is to uh, topical is uh, typical. No, that's something else altogether. That's all right. On that same list, table 36.3, that's the flucanazoles there at the top. A little bit further down, you should know meconazole. No, you should know teoconazole down at the bottom. Vagistat. Teoconazole. Vagistat. So this is a, a vaginal suppository, also for fungal infections. This is the one that I'm telling you sometimes women might request this if you're going to give them an antibiotic because sometimes the antibiotic will cause a fungal infect, a yeast infection. And this is where these medications might have to be prescribed along with the antibiotic for the UTI because these women automatically already know, oh, I'm going to get a, a, a yeast infection. Think uh, diabetic women because their blood sugar is higher. So with all that sugar in the system, bacteria, I mean, uh, fungus can grow fast. Yeah. Uh, with the sweat is much sweeter as well. Anyways, so uh, what else is on this list? Down at the bottom is going to be your superficials, and there it is. Nice statin. We'll go look at that. But don't forget the last two at the bottom. Terbinafin, terbinafin and toflanate. Both of those are for tinea pedis, tinea curis, tinea capitis. So this is ringworm, and ringworm is not a worm. Ringworm is a fungus. These are topical antifungals. Just call it ringworm. It leaves that with a bald spot. But it's not a worm, so don't be prescribing the, the, the anti-helminths for that. Nystatin is going to be your topical of choice over on page 574, your prototype drug. Uh, basically, look at the administration alert. For, for oral candidiasis, which is thrush, Swabs on the affected area for children. A little bit further down. For adults, oral candida, the drug should be right there. Swished in the mouth for at least two minutes. And then you swallow it so that it can coat all of the, the, the throat as well. Good, good, good. What else do we got? What's the next one on your list? Oh, there you go. The teoconazole, tofurinate. And we just said that those are going to be for topical fungal infections of the feet and of the body right now. Candida albicans, we already discussed it. It can come in. So when we say thrush or ringworm, it's all the same thing. Candida is the same, same, same thing. Tetracycline, that was in the previous chapter. Tetracyclines. Let's go look at that really quick on chapter 35. We're coming up to an hour now. Chapter 35, 34, 34, 35. Which one is it? Tetracycline. How did I bounce back to over here? Probably an extra question we got thrown in there. Tetracycline, over on page 547. Tetracycline, antibacterial, tetracycline. It says, very effective, uh, chlamydia, rickettsia, mycoplasm. So this might even be used a little bit for sometimes for certain strains of TB. Can also be used for H. pylori of the stomach. Tetracycline, given PO, short half-life. Also comes in a topical preparation as well. Admin, uh, adverse, no, administration alert, oral drug, full glass of water, administer antacids, one to three hours apart, but we knew that for all of them. Adverse effect, being a broad spectrum, tetracycline has a tendency to affect vaginal, oral, and intestinal flora and could cause super infections. So this will definitely, might cause a yeast infection. Other common side effects include discoloration of the teeth, photosensitivity, remember those two, that's a classic NCLEX question. And then um, interactions, milk products, iron supplements, magnesium. Well, we knew that already. Antacids, we knew that already. That's for everything. We already knew that. A little bit further down, herbal food interactions, dairy products. We knew that already. Cool. You knew this. You already knew that. What's the next drug? Chloroquine. Oh, we're back to chloroquine. We're back to page 577. 577. Table 36.5, selective drugs for malaria. Another way of saying malaria, that's the disease, but what's the bug that causes malaria? Plasmodium. Plasmodium causes malaria. Now, if you have a history of plasmodium in the family, if you have a history of malaria in the family, it's a potential that you might have sickle cell trait or sickle cell anemia. And there's no surprise somebody has sickle cell anemia. There's a history of something related to plasmodium in the family history. 
or origins in the family back to Africa, because Africa is usually where the mosquitoes uh, that carry malaria, that carry plasmodium, are most common. Does that make sense? So no surprise, this is usually African Americans. So look at the connection between sickle cell anemia and malaria, plasmodium. Does that make sense? So plasmodium, uh, drugs for plasmodium, page 577, and your prototype drug is chloroquine. However, we also have chloroquine and we have hydrochloroquine that's on your review as well. So we're going to hit one hour already. Let's pick up from there on the next video. See you in a bit.